card that I found for my dad for Father's Day had a picture of the family headed out on the family trip and uh, said, thanks, Dad, for all that you do, and thanks, Dad, for, and on the inside it said, never actually turning the car around. <laughs> Many of us have heard that when we were growing up. Don't make me turn this car around. <laughs> It was our first day. We were all anxious and excited. We had been through several days of training and the time had arrived. So we each took the elevator to our respected floor, reported to the nurse in charge and received our patient list. The moment to which I am referring was when I was serving as a chaplain while in seminary in a hospital in Louisville. And I'll never forget what the hospital chaplain told us right before he released us on our solo day. He said, when you get to that floor and you report to that nurse, you claim your task. He said, play your part. Do not go up there and stand there and wait for the nurse to affirm you in some way or give you permission to go do this. This is your role. So do it. So we took that patient list and I began to go into hospital rooms at 24 years of age looking about 16 walking into rooms of people that obviously were hurting and hoping and praying that somehow God would use me to bring comfort. And I'll never forget walking into one older man's room who had had a heart issue and saying, uh, Sir, my name is Rusty Brock. I'm the chaplain. I wanted to see if I could do anything for you, have prayer with you. And he looked at me and he said, Young man, you haven't lived long enough to tell me anything. And I said, you're right, so let's pray. <laughs> we'll make it quick. <laughs> Call on a higher power. Play the part. It was time. It was the moment. I remember when Carrie and I were living in Atlanta after graduating from seminary. We were working with the CBF, and there was a search committee from Fitzgerald, Georgia, that wanted to hear me preach. And so I arranged it with the pastor of Druid Hills Baptist Church in Atlanta to go and to preach. And so I went that Sunday to Druid Hills Baptist, historic church in Atlanta, grand sanctuary, preached the sermon that day. Committee, obviously, those of you who know my journey, we ended up going to Fitzgerald and, and pastoring there. And Carrie filled out a visitor card that day. Well, that afternoon, the phone rings, and of course, this was pre, you know, caller ID showing up. So I answered the phone, uh, Mr. Brock, yes, this is Bob, I'm a deacon at Druid Hills Baptist Church, and noticed you visited today. And I said, uh, yes, sir, we did. And he said, well, I just wanted you to know we're really glad that you visited, and we hope that you'll come back, because that was not our preacher today that did the sermon. <laughs> And I said, yes, sir, I know. I'm the one that did the sermon. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it turned out okay. Somebody liked it, so that was good. There comes that moment, though, when it is time to play the part of your calling or your training. Some of you are teachers, you remember that first day in class. And depending on the age of the class, you knew that you somehow had to let them know who was in charge or you were going to get eaten alive. But it was your moment. It was time. Or the first day of residency, 
the first day as a coach, maybe the head coach, the first time you were in charge of a mission trip, the first time you led music in worship, it was time to play the part. The time had come, the bell had rung, the spotlight was shining, and it was the moment. As our story continues with young David, we are told that one of his first parts to play as the newly anointed one of Israel was to play the harp for King Saul. According to Scripture, David had the gift for playing a harp. David was also one who tended sheep. He was a shepherd who played the harp. And now I remember the first time I studied this text thinking, wow, because the only harp I had ever seen played was this great big harp that would sit like up here and you'd sit and you'd strum it. And I always wondered, where did he play this harp when he was tending sheep? But of course, the harp he played was much smaller. One that he carried with him everywhere he went. He played a harp, I'm sure, and the sheep responded to this sound. He played a harp for his own contentment as he watched the sheep. But he had a gift. And David is summoned to the palace by King Saul's guards because of that gift. And because an evil spirit was tormenting King Saul. And it's interesting, the scripture actually says an evil spirit from the Lord was tormenting King Saul. And as one writer says, it's as if as soon as David was anointed and received the spirit... King Saul became tormented by the Spirit. It was as if Saul knew that his days of reign were over. He did not yet know what was at play with David. But King Saul hears that David can play the harp and and they summon David to the palace And so unbeknownst to David, his harp had become part of God's anointing plan. His preparation to be king. And imagine that nerve-wracking moment of going to play the harp for the king. I mean, it needed to go well. If he didn't play the harp well, if it didn't encourage King Saul or comfort King Saul, then most likely it would cost him his head or he would be in the dungeon. But it was his time in that moment to play the part. In his book, Leap Over the Wall, Eugene Peterson says, David's job playing for King Saul was in fact king work. David was both a servant and a king. He didn't know that at the time. But Peterson says his faithfulness to the task was a royal success. So a question for us is, are we playing our part as if it is king work? Peterson says king work represents all true work because work originates from the creator who worked hard and then rested. He says that true work, king work, will always manifest itself in serving because another king servant by the name of Jesus said, I came to serve, not be served. And you should do as I have done for you. Do you see your daily work as king work? Peterson remembers watching his dad in his dad's butcher shop growing up. He said his dad was a butcher and he, he re- realized one day that as all the customers came into the butcher shop that 
there were some parallels between what his dad was doing and when they went to worship. Because the same people were coming, looking for nourishment. The same people were coming with all of the stuff going on in their lives. And they were looking not only for the food that the butcher would cut and hand to them, but they were looking for someone to hear them and care about them and serve them. And one day he realized his dad wore a white apron as if he was a priest serving those who came. He says his dad approached his job like it was king work. His dad would have known that language, but he was a servant. Are you playing your part like it's king work? As a father, are you, are we playing our part as fathers like king work? Do we realize the, the magnitude of, of what we're doing? Are we teaching our children about love and respect and honor and sacrifice? And are we showing them through our lives? Do they look upon us and say, wow, that's king work right there. Too often we only think of our work as a royal pain. Perhaps we should see it as royal opportunities to serve in the name of Christ. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. Now we said that David played the harp for Saul because it brought Saul comfort. Verse 23 says, Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his harp and play, and then relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. God used David to bring comfort to King Saul. David's music calmed a stormy soul. David's playing was music to Saul's ears and to his heart. And that is a lesson for us as a church. We are anointed to bring comfort to distressed souls. We are anointed to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to share hope and grace with all who come. And we're anointed to share that with all whom we know, whether they are here or not. And we are reminded all too often that our world is filled with troubled souls and with hurting hearts and with people in need of comfort. I mean, this past week, with the shootings in Orlando and then the individual losses, the family at Disney, this morning on the news, a family lost a three-year-old in a drowning yesterday. Every day, somebody is hurting. And this week, is, it's also been hopeful and comforting to see the outpouring of love and support for those in Orlando and others from around the world, including the support and the voices of love and grace from the church with, a, with the exception of a few ridiculous situations. But here's what we've got to be sure of. While the outpouring of love has been encouraging, the tendency is it fades away with the headlines. The church must always be voices of love and support. We must always say to hurting, scared, rejected souls, hurting souls, we welcome you in the name of Christ. 
We must understand that we as the church have been anointed to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor always, always. That is our part to play. That is the mission of the church. And it must be our mission. It must be our king work. Even if we're nervous that we might play the wrong note. We must be the voice and the presence of Christ the King. In her book, Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamont, talks about why she makes her young son, Sam, go to church. Sam got a little older. His friends weren't going to church. And he asked the question one day, why do I have to go to church? And so she started thinking about all that. And she said, you know, I make Sam go to church because I want to give him what I found in the world. Which is to say, I found a path with a little light to see by. I make Sam go to church because I want him to know people who seem to follow a brighter light than the glimmer of their own candle. When I was at the end of my rope, the people at our church tied a knot in it for me and helped me hang on. That's why I make Sam go to church. I want Sam to know people like Mary Williams, a beautiful elderly lady who wears big hats and shouts hallelujah and who also comes up and gives me these little glad bags full of change because she knows we need them. That's why I make Sam go to church. And she says, when I was a kid, I just imagined that adults had some kind of inner toolbox full of shiny tools the saw of discernment and the hammer of wisdom and the sandpaper of patience. She says, but when I grew up, I found out that really what happens if life gives you a bunch of rusted bent tools called friendship and prayer and conscience and honesty and life says, here, do what you can. People at the church seem to know what to do with them. And that's why I make Sam go to church. So let's take our rusty tools and make them sing as we play our part for the King. Amen.